everybody. Welcome to South Florida Business and Wealth's virtual CEO Connect, air travel today and tomorrow. My name is Clayton Idle and I'm the Managing Director of South Florida Business and Wealth. I'd like to start by thanking all of our panelists and also all of our attendees for joining us today for our virtual CEO Connect panel discussion. We do recognize a lot of familiar names on the uh, webinar today, but if you're not familiar with who we are and what we do, South Florida Business and Wealth helps you connect to the top area executives in South Florida. We do that several different ways. Most people know us by our monthly publication, reaches several thousand CEOs and other executives, business owners, all throughout South Florida. We also have a whole suite of digital assets, such as email and, and social media marketing to help grow your business. And lastly, we do have a pretty robust event platform, which right now is all virtual, like I'm sure we're all used to being uh, virtual, doing webinars like this over the last several months. When it's safe to do so, we are very, very excited to get back up and running and, and seeing a lot of your faces. Um, whatever, if for whatever reason you're not receiving our every other day e-newsletter or our publication, we will follow up with an email and you can easily get added to our distribution list. Um, also today we are, we do want to make things interactive. So if you do have questions, please submit those through the Q&A feature, which is going to be at the bottom of your screen. And we will get to those at some point during the discussion. Now, before we get started, I would like to uh, introduce some of our great, great sponsors of our CEO Connect series that help make events like this happen. I'm going to kick it off with uh, Mr. Gil Pomar, who is the Executive Vice President, also Regional President for South Florida for Center State Bank. Gil, take it away, my friend. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be associated with this group, uh, South Florida Businesses and Wealth, and Gary and Olivia and and Clayton certainly uh, consider them great partners uh, for our business and, and have enjoyed a long relationship. Um, we, um, we've been busy taking care of customers in this, uh, in this environment. We did over 10,000 PPP loans, almost at 1.5 billion. And so we are uh, engaged, as you can imagine, in, in this time, really taking care of our customers. Uh, we are definitely open for business. So if you, if you hear of a bank that is closed for business, think about Center State Bank. If you hear about someone who didn't really get taken care of as well as perhaps they should have during the PPP uh, situation and even others, just remember Center State Bank. Uh, we, uh, we're now the largest bank based in the state of Florida. So anyway, great to be on. I look forward to seeing you guys in person, hopefully very soon. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, you guys are an incredible bank, and, and thanks again for your continued support. And uh, love to see you keep growing in the recent acquisition and now the largest Florida-based bank. That's, that's incredible, Gail. Kudos. Thanks. All right, we're going to move on to uh, Gianna Pants uh, Pazzanelli. Excuse me, Gianna. I always somehow butcher your last name. Um, she is with Brick, which is the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, and also Crocker Partners. And I'm going to kick the virtual microphone over to you, Gianna. Thank you, Clayton. Um, nice to see you guys all virtually. Um, as Clayton said, I'm the marketing director for Crocker Partners, who, which acquired Boca Raton Innovation Campus in 2018. Uh, we have been um, a multi-use uh, office building for many years. It was the birthplace of the first personal computer. And we are looking to uh, reinvigorate the campus and actually make it an event venue and build uh, first class amenities, which are currently underway. We have a few coffee shops opening at the end of the year and we will have a presentation hall that will be able to seat up to a thousand. Um, obviously our event venue, which we have we've enjoyed hosting South Florida Business and Wealth events in the past, um, has been on pause, but we do have our first virtual event um, taking place August 13th. Um, it is going to be a panel discussion with local leaders to discuss the upcoming local election on August 18th for Palm Beach County. We'll have a state senator, a uh, few county and city commissioners, and obviously um, supervisor of elections. So it's a very relevant topic and we hope to see some of you guys there too. Thank you, Gianna. And uh, you're right, you, you do have a first class facility. Thank you for your partnership. We've really enjoyed doing events with you. And, and if anyone on this webinar today, if you have not seen the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, it's absolutely gorgeous what you guys have done and keep up the good work. 
All right. We do have a few other sponsors. I know Mike Wolfson from C3 Cloud Computing Concepts. He was on. He just dropped off. I think he was having some technical difficulties. So I will leave him to the very end. I will announce Celebrity Cruises. So you see their logo in the background. Um, unfortunately, could not make it today. But when they do get up and running, please, let's all support Celebrity Cruises. They're a pillar in our South Florida community. And um, we really hope that they get up and running as, as quickly as possible. Um, also, ProFi, they are a very, very innovative, young, fast-growing company specializing in construction, building maintenance, and pressure cleaning services for commercial buildings all throughout South Florida and now even into, uh, into Central Florida. So Mike, unfortunately, Mike Lauditz couldn't visit today and, and be with us, but um, he's done an incredible job growing his company. I just saw Mike Wolfson pop back on from C3 Cloud Computing Concepts. Let's see if uh, if Mike is up and running. If not, I will give him a plug because we use them and they do fantastic work. Mike, you with us? All right, looks like he still might be having some issues, but they're also a fast growing company with offices in Miami, home headquarters in Delray Beach and have expanded into uh, Ohio and even out to the West Coast. So any type of IT services you need, Mike is your man and C3 is, uh, is definitely the company to look out for. Um, all right, let's get on to the main event. I am going to read the bios for Laura Beebe, Mark Gale, and Lester Sola, and then I'm going to kick it over to our fearless leader, Chairman and CEO Gary Pretz, to get on to the main event. So starting with Laura Beebe from uh, Palm Beach International Airport. Ms. Beebe has served as the Director of Airports for the Palm Beach County Department of Airports since January 2019. The Palm Beach County Department of Airports owns and operates a system of four airports, including Palm Beach International Airport, also known as PBI, located in West Palm Beach, and three general aviation airports. Together, the county airport system generates over $5.7 billion in business revenue and supports more than 49,000 direct and indirect jobs. PBI is an award-winning airport serving more than 6.9 million passengers annually. In 2019, PBI was named the eighth best domestic airport by Travel and Leisure Magazine. Also the eighth best airport in the United States by Condé Nast Travelers 2019 Reader's Choice Awards, and also fifth best medium airport in 2019 by J.D. Power North American Airport Satisfaction Survey. PB has served Palm Beach County for more than 20 years, most recently as the Deputy Director of Airports and Business Affairs of the Palm Beach County Department of Airports. Before joining Palm Beach County Department of Airports, she worked as the Assistant County Attorney for Palm Beach County, representing the Department of Airports. Ms. Beebe reserved, uh, excuse me, received a BS from the University of Florida, I know we have some Gators here today, College of Journalism and Communications with a minor in Business Administration and JD from University of Florida College of Law. Laura, welcome. Thank you, I appreciate uh, you having me on today. Absolutely, we appreciate you coming aboard. All right, next up we have Mark Gale from Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. Mark Gale assumed the position of CEO, Director of Aviation for the Broward County Aviation Department in March 2016. He is responsible for the executive management and operation of Broward County's Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International, also known as FLL, and North Perry, also known as HWO airports, including strategic vision development and implementation of capital programs, financial performance, new goals and objectives. Prior to his position as CEO, Director of Aviation for Broward County, Mark served as the CEO of Philadelphia International Airport from 2009 to 2016 as the Deputy Director of Aviation for Operations and Facilities from 2000 to 2009. Mark held several positions with PHL dating back to 1985 and retired from the city of Philadelphia in January of 2016. Mark, we're happy to have you in South Florida. Welcome. Thank you, Clayton. Good to be with you today. Thank you. 
And last, but, uh, oh, I forgot, Mark, sorry, last sentence here. Mark also holds a bachelor degree in aviation management from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Sorry to leave that out. No worries. Uh, and Mark, I'll give you a quick little plug. My family and I just flew. We got back last night and used your airport. And uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, the elevated amount of customer service, social distancing, and you could just feel the cleanliness in the airport. So uh, yeah. obviously you guys are, uh, you're onto something. We're all gonna hear from, uh, from each and every one of you about what's, <laughs> what's happening in your, uh, your airports today. Glad you had a good trip, Trip. Thanks, Mark. Last but certainly not least is Lester Sola from Miami International Airport. Lester is the director and CEO of the Miami-Dade Aviation Department. He oversees operations at Miami International Airport, also known as MIA, and four other general aviation airports in the Miami area, which together generate, wow, over $31.9 billion in business revenue support more than 275,000 direct and indirect jobs. MIA leads the way, handling more than 45 million passengers and more than 2 million tons of cargo annually, placing it among Americans' busiest international passenger and cargo airports. Mr. Sola has served Miami-Dade County for more than 26 years, most recently as director of the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. During his more than two decades of public service, Mr. Sola has been responsible for reorganization of several county departments, coordination and refocusing of the capital management at Miami International Airport, establishment of small and minority-based programs for the procurement of goods and services, establishment of central, centralized systems for the tracking of county capital expansion programs and professional services, and the provision of management direction to county departments, management agreements, and agencies such as Aviation, Seaport, Beacon Council, Forming Arts Center, and the American Airlines Arena. Mr. Sola has a master's degree and bachelor's degree in public administration with a minor in organizational psychology from Florida International University. Lester, welcome. Thank you, Clayton. Glad to be here with, with you all. Thanks so much for joining us as well. Well, now on for the main event. I'm going to pass our virtual microphone over to my dear friend, our chairman and CEO of South Florida Business and Wealth and several other companies, Mr. Gary Press. Gary, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, I want to thank uh, you know, the panelists. This is a very esteemed group. We have uh, about 150 people who have come on to, to watch this. So I want to uh, thank everybody who's out there watching. For Laura, I'm going to do something a little special for Laura. That's okay, Laura. Okay. Okay, let's do that. Ah! <laughs> oh. Go, Go Gators. Gators! Go Gators! All right. So, um, so this is going to be fun because you know, airports are associated, you know, with business and and, and vacations and. You know, I think all of us, you know, get excited when we're even, you know, certainly on vacations, but even, even on business trips. It's fun to get out of town. It's fun to go meet other people, fun to go to conferences. Um, and it's been a tough time. And it's, uh, you know, this pandemic has really uh, changed the entire world and certainly the, you know, flying. And I'm, I'm really glad to see the numbers going up and people flying again. Um, so let's kick into it. And uh, first question for the group is, as, say, as Clayton said, you know, he had a very good experience. Um, what are some of the things your airport is doing to make traveling easier um, and safer, uh, like disinfecting, social distancing, wearing masks? Um, what, are the, what are those things you guys are doing? I'll, I'll start it off with Mark, if that's okay. Well, thanks, Gary, and good to be with you today and all our colleagues that are on the line. Um, I too very much would rather we be doing this in person. Uh, this virtual thing is okay for me, but uh, I like face-to-face -face contact. And I think that the people that travel through airports also like face-to-face -face contact. Um, you know, I got a call the other day from one of our commissioners and said, tell me honestly, do you think it's safe to fly? And I said, of course it is. And, and they said, have you flown? And I said, well, I actually just flew uh, you know, the week prior. And I, and I went through all the different things that what's happening on board the airplane. And, and a lot of people really don't know how wonderful the ventilation systems are in airplanes and, and the safety that goes into that. 
But then we got into this discussion about what are we doing in our airport, our economic engine in order to help uh, drive our region and get us back to where we need to get back. What are you doing, Mark, with your team in order to make sure that our patrons feel safe? And I think that Lester and Laura would also uh, chime in that, you know, we're all doing uh, the best jobs that we can to, to provide that, that sense of, of confidence. Uh, we refer to ours as public com confidence initiatives. Uh, we started a program here at Fort Lauderdale called Fly Safer, Fly Smarter, Fly Better, um, and, it, and it's targeted um, to, our, to our patrons, telling them all the things that we're doing, and I'm sure that my colleagues are doing from a cleanliness standpoint, whether you're extra cleaning or electrostatic spraying or social distancing amongst seats, wiping everything down a million times a day, and putting up acrylic face shields, uh, sneeze guards, if you will. All those things are, are great. And you're seeing it in virtually in every uh, public business, so whether it's the supermarket, the bank, uh, the Lowe's, whatever the case may be. But how are we gonna go the extra mile in order to, to get that out there? Uh, we all spend a lot of time uh, on strategy to try to uh, restore and, and bring that, that confidence back public service announcements, social media uh, messaging, YouTube videos. Uh, sometimes we get through, sometimes we don't. Uh, the whole notion of, thank goodness we don't have to wear them for this virtual call, because some really don't like to wear the mask, but we, don't, uh, we, we shouldn't uh, underestimate just how important those masks are. Uh, much like my colleagues, we took possession of a large quantity of masks from FEMA. In our case, it was uh, approximately 1.5 million masks. And, and we have teams of people that walk around the airport. Uh, we have really, really, really great compliance. I have to say our passengers and our employees are really doing a great job of wearing the mask. Every now and then they'll pull it down and, you know, they get a breath of fresh air or they want to take a bite of their sandwich or whatnot. But generally uh, wearing their mask. Um, but if not, we politely remind them of the requirement uh, give them a mask and, and go about our way. Um, but we have a long way to go uh, in this pandemic. And, and this is one of those things where we just cannot let our foot up off the gas. We need to keep working as a team, all of us, not just the three airports that we have here, but every airport across the country has to put, uh, put their shoulder to this one and, and help get it done along with our airline partners. Thank, thanks, Mark. That was, that was terrific. Uh, Laura, what, do you, what would you like to, to add to that? So we're, we're doing all the same things um, that Mark is doing. The extra cleaning, um, we're actually closing our terminal after the last arriving flight, just so that we can thoroughly disinfect the facilities without any of the public in, in, being involved. Um, we have elect electrostatic sprayers. Um, we have actually posted our preparedness plan on our website, pbia.org, which includes the detailed information of all the different things that we're doing. Um, we're taking it even one step further. We're seeking a industrial cleaning certification. You may have all heard of it, GBAC. Um, I think we may have been the first airport in the United States to actually submit an application for that certification. Um, our janitorial staff is already ISSA certified. Um, we've added additional general, uh, janitorial staff. We've gone above and beyond acrylic barriers, um, extra cleaning, social, social distance messaging, um, overhead as well as signage. Um, so we're doing all of those same things in, in an effort to restore co uh, customer confidence in the airport and air travel generally. So um, we also have a mandatory mask order in Palm Beach County that is being adhered to very well in the airport by our customers and by all of the airport employees. Um, I, I would like to echo that that is a really important thing that our customers need to adhere to for airport safety, not only for themselves, but also for our staff. Um, but uh, it, it's I think essentially most airports, if not all airports in the United States, are, United States are taking uh, many of the same measures. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm sure you guys are doing very similar things. Lester, anything you want to add to that or to your take on it? Yeah, you know, obviously everything that my colleagues are, are saying, we're, we're all doing that. Um, the only thing that I would say that we're, we're also doing, and I know that they're doing as well too, is, is education and messaging. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just like Mark gets questions, is it safe to fly? You know, because people have this, this vision of I'm um, breathing the same air over and over and over again. So we're partnering with our airlines here so that people even understand 
how the filtration system of an airplane works, right? And when you compare that filtration system to an office building where the majority of the air is, is in fact being recirculated as opposed to what's happening in the, in the airplane, it changes people's mindset. So messaging, being consistent with that message, whether it be your local government, so that people who are coming to your airport understand the requirements, what it is in their community, but also the same requirements that are being enforced at the airport. So, you know, education and messaging of that journey will ho hopefully reinstitute a new mindset of what is going to be the requirements in order for you to be able to travel for a short period of time. I mean, we're not talking about a, a long period of time. The majority of our internal, international flights are gone. So the majority of our flights are really domestic in nature, and those are just a few hours. So if you take the measures in, in the, that are required, right, whether it be social distancing, your mask, taking some disinfecting liquid, you'll be able to travel quite comfortably and quite safe. Yeah, that make, make, makes sense. And I, I think as we go along, um, um, I may I may ask one of you guys your thoughts on this, but but you guys, can, I'm going to ask questions, and you guys can jump in and just answer the questions. Some of you may want to pass on certain questions if if uh, your colleagues are ready to kind of the same thing. So my next question is. Is there anything new we should expect as passengers uh, when it comes to security? When you're going through security, are there any new measures or, or pretty much stand, it's, it's what, it, what it was before? Mark? From our perspective, the, uh, you know, the name of the game right now tends to be contactless in, in virtually every aspect of our business. To, you know, if you can avoid touching things, then that is obviously the ultimate in, in, uh, in safety. I can't remember the name of the movie uh, with, uh, uh, I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's on Mars and when he's going through this uh, security device where he just walks through and it can take pictures and see where everything's at, but he doesn't have to touch anything. I really don't think that we're all that far from that type of technology and it, it could uh, be deployed, I think, in, within, certainly within the next decade. Uh, you know, if we, um, I've seen other reports that says we're facing this pandemic um, today and, and it may not leave us for a while. And it's probably the most serious um, health issue that we face since, you know, um, the Spanish flu in 1918. But there's also been a forewarning that we could face other types of viruses and, and pandemics in the not too distant future. Some of these things are, are going to be com commonplace for our business. And TSA doesn't want to touch your phone. They don't want to touch your boarding pass. You do it all yourself right now. You know, those bins that you're putting your stuff in, are they being cleaned and disinfected regularly? You know, folks are wearing gloves. Is it better to wear gloves or not wear gloves? Um, Laura's point is great, education. We have to continue to educate our, our passengers on what are the best practices. Unfortunately, sometimes the best practice uh, scale or the measure changes from CDC or others. We just right. have to do the best we can as professional airport executives to keep our, our patrons as, as informed as we possibly can. Yeah, we go, since it's started, we, we've heard a lot of information and a lot of misinformation um, as we get deeper into this. I mean, Laura, I know you, you wanted to, to say something about this. Well, I, yeah, I'm echoing pretty much what Mark has already said. Um, the security checkpoints themselves are, are there's a lot less contact. Um, everybody's being very uh, observant of social distancing. As far as security procedures themselves, um, those are the same procedures that you've normally experienced in the past, um, other than the enhanced cleaning and the social distancing and um, in that ensuring that the TSA staff, they're all wearing their masks, you know, when they're having contact with customers, also wearing face shields. Um, so the biggest change really has to do with just the um, COVID related um, impacts. Sure. sure. Uh, Lester, the next question, I'm going to start with you. So it's, so it's, so it's fair, but uh, do you have anything to add to this question? You know, the, the only thing that I'll say is that we, and I'll, and I'll speak for, for our airport here, we've been a little resistant uh, in, in walking gingerly on the issue with regards to testing passengers, right? We get a lot of pressure from our elected or people in the industry or people who want to fly. Why aren't you doing testing? Why aren't you taking people's temperatures? And, and it, it, again, it goes back to the education. We don't want to institute something that really isn't giving us a true indication of what we're looking at. So while the, we're in, in 
our pushback for the most part has been, look, we want to do whatever is in the best interest of our flying public, but that has yet to be determined what kind of testing is going to be done. So we don't want you to say, when you come to MIA, you're going to get a temperature check, or and then when you get to another airport, there's no temperature check. And then people start comparing as, well, who's being safer? So we're, we're, we're basically pushing the need for you to wear a mask, for you to social distancing, and protective measures that you as an individual can take rather than taking on the responsibility of testing, if you will, passengers. I, th I think that's, that's, that's an area that we're, we're trying to walk very slowly until that's we right. have a sure measure of what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I can see why, because, you know, you have, uh, you have companies who are doing this and, you know, uh, you know, the employee can go back and work from home if their temperature is a, is a half a degree above normal and get a test. But when you're going on a flight and you start testing people, I can see a, a lot of angry people who, you know, maybe, you know, uh, half a percent higher, but they bought their tickets, they're there, they feel fine. So. I understand where you're coming from. It's a tough or, or, or you could be asymptomatic and you're giving individuals a false sense of security that everything is perfectly fine. Then you can let your guard down when exactly. in fact our message is consistent. No, you have to wear your mask. You have to practice social distancing. Watch what we're doing. That's what we're requiring our employees to do it. That's why even though the volume of, of passengers is down, we haven't cut back uh, on when we started doubling up on the measures of janitorial and disinfecting activities because the message has to be consistent. We want everyone to conform to the rules and, and not let their guard down, just because one person doesn't have a temperature and one person is not particularly higher. Gotcha. Okay, this next question is uh, not COVID related. It, it took, I took a look at, um, you know, at uh, you know, some national studies and um, I came up with, uh, or what I, what I read was that uh, Fort Lauderdale ranks second in the nation on costs, this is just cost, not quality. But the, an average flight out of uh, FLL is about two hundred and forty-five dollars. Uh, Miami is twelfth, um, you know, at uh, about three nineteen, and Palm Beach ranks a little higher at thirty-fourth at three thirty-four. I mean, there are many, many factors to go into why why the differences, in, including more international flights, including, including real estate, including the deal you make with the the airlines, but can can each of you talk a little bit about uh, about pricing and 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 what your strategies are? I mean, Lester, you want to go first on this one? So, with regards to pricing, I mean that's that's really an area for the airlines. I think we all, as as an airport running an airport, try to keep our costs down because we're constantly getting pressure from the airlines, not just the airlines, but the cargo airlines on how much does it cost me to operate at this airport. Right. But but I will I would tell you that mm -hmm. you're with a certain amount of measure. It doesn't matter what it costs for them to operate at the airport if they can turn a significant profit on the routes that they're selling, right? So if, if, if an airline can price their ticket at a price point that there's very little competition, especially going into the Latin American market, and you have a public that's willing to pay for it, it's the, the, the situation is much more complex than just how much does it cost for someone to buy a ticket to go from point A to point B? The kind of seats that they're selling, uh, the kind of cargo that they're moving in the belly of the planes. And, and oftentimes we see, we saw, we saw flights leaving Miami after this, this pandemic got hold, empty passenger planes, but full of cargo because they still needed to move that cargo and there, and there was a demand for that cargo. So it's, it's, it's a very complex situation with regards to the pricing, but the, the airlines, I think, are smart enough to find a, 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 a particular type of customer that they can sell their tickets to, but the pressures will always be on the airport to try and maintain your costs down. So what we drive ourselves is with is what efficiencies can we generate and what can we do to pass down savings to an airline for them to continue to fly here or to entice a new airline to choose to fly here. Makes sense. Laura? So I'm, I'm really proud to tell you that we have one of the lowest costs per employment for airlines to um, operate at, at the Palm Beach International Airport throughout the country. Um, as far as airline pricing, we, we really don't have control over that. Um, that that's determined by the airlines. It's, it's determined by the number of flights that are available. 
Um, typically, the pricing tends to go up a bit as the, the planes start to become fuller. Um, the yields, meaning the amount of money that people, the airlines are making um, for their flights out of Palm Beach tends to be higher um, because we do have uh, very uh, high quality customers. Um, we have a lot of good business travel. We have a lot of um, corporate headquarters here. Uh, so there is that ability to charge a little bit more out of Palm sure. Beach and um, still be able to maintain uh, good passenger loads. So I think it's based on what the airlines are, are able to actually achieve. Um, but as far as airport costs, um, our parking fees are some of the lowest in, in the United States. And our costs to the airlines are, are by far some, some of the lowest costs per employment. So we're very, very conscious of the costs. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, competition for uh, routes and flights. Um, we want to make sure that we maintain the, being competitive. Um, and, and, and again, while there may be situations where uh, some of the flights themselves may be a little bit higher out of Palm Beach, we do find that our customers still desire to fly out of our airport because of the experience that we provide. So um, we, we really are proud of what we do here at Palm Beach. Yeah, well, I, th I think we're lucky overall. We, you know, South Florida, um, between, the, between the three major airports, are, are much lower than, than the rest of the nation. And um, all three airports uh, have great leaders, and you guys have been um, being able to make it better and better for us to fly. I think, I think the flying experience pre-COVID uh, was much better than it was 10 years ago. Um, I can see, you know, South Florida as a business community is growing, and the airports are certainly, uh, you guys, the three of you are doing a great job at, at keeping up with the economy growing and providing great service. Uh, Mark, you want to want to comment as well? Just a, a couple of additions. Um, what was that first thing you said about FLL being the, like the second lowest? That sounded yeah. Uh, Two forty-five is the average flight. Las Vegas, Las Vegas was the only one that beat you, buddy. <laughs> Look out, we're coming for you, Las Vegas. But um, so a couple of different things. Um, not a lot of folks know, or they don't think about it this way. We do, obviously, as airport directors. Lester kind of mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, but on, on the airline side of the house, airport costs as a function of their overall costs uh, tend to be rather small. Um, they're paying a whole lot more in fuel costs and labor costs and maintenance and aircraft debt service and depreciation. I'm not saying that airport costs necessarily are insignificant, but they, but they certainly are not necessarily what's driving what's going to happen with the airline as it relates to fares. It helps, um, in our case, uh, to, um, to have a plethora, if you will, of, of low-cost airlines, if you will, or even ultra-low-cost airlines, the, the JetBlues, the Spirits, the Southwest, the, the Allegiance, and more, who choose to use our facility uh, and they generally have a lower cost structure than, let's say, some of the legacy carriers. Um, those low-cost airlines generally tend not to have a lot of space. Um, they use common use space frequently. They don't necessarily have big airline clubs and, and whatnot. So their costs are generally lower. Um, I think the way that airport management chooses to utilize the funds that are available to it, uh, certainly uh, passenger facility charges that you collect, grants that we get from the FAA, and I'm going to give a big plug and shout here to the federal department, excuse me, the Florida Department of Transportation, FDOT, for the assistance they give airports all across the state of Florida. We work very, very well with them, and I, and I think that they've been uh, a great help to us. Non-airline revenue, what we get from parking, or I should say what we used to get from parking pre-COVID, and rental cars, and concessions. Um, at, at a certain point in time, uh, our, our split was about 70% non-airline revenue and only about 30% of our revenue requirement came from the airlines. If we can keep our costs low, that certainly helps and makes us very, very attractive to uh, airlines to come and locate here at our airport. Last thing I would mention that goes to that ticket price, competition, competition, competition. It really is the name of the game. Um, if we take our top 50 domestic markets, 39 out of our top 50 uh, domestic markets have more than one airline serving that route segment. Um, so when you have two or more airlines competing on that route segment, it actually works very, very well to drive those costs down. So um, yeah, I, I certainly hope that we get that non-airline revenue back. 
what's going to happen to my airport, to Lester's airport, to Lara's airport is um, some of those sources of revenue that have gone away. Our fiscal year budgets uh, next go around could look much different in terms of overall airport cost. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so you guys all were talking about communicating with, with travelers. Can you be a little more specific as to, as to how you are communicating with them? So I'll, I'll say this with, with regards to, to us, right? We, 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 regardless of social media, we'll put that on the side because we're constantly trying to push a particular messages through those, through those vehicles. When you come to the airport now, you, not just, you're not just looking at screens that are, that are telling you where your flight to your departures. Um, you're also seeing messages, audio video messages through the screens of social distancing, the mass requirement, things that we're doing. We're, we're piping in a message also through, through audio. Uh, depending on where you're out in the airport. If it's pre-security, you get a specific message. If it's post-security, you get a different message as you're queuing up waiting for, for your flight. So where in the past we would have focused on welcoming people to MIA, uh, now we're not just welcoming you, but we're also asking you and directing you of how you need to navigate uh, the airport. Yeah, great. Um, you want to say something, Mark? I was going to let Laura go if she wanted to go. Or... Oh, Laura. Sure. Uh, we're doing a lot of the same things. Um, we, we do do a lot of social media outreach. Um, we've also, you know, tried to highlight our own um, employees at the airport as well, essential employees that have been here throughout this, you know, this current situation. Um, that's been very well received. Um, our messaging right now is primarily informational, um, you know, letting people know about what we're doing to make sure that they're staying safe and healthy at the airport, the things that we're doing every day behind the scenes. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of the same things that um, the other airports are doing right now. Um, and it's, it's primarily through, you know, social media, in terminal messaging, um, our website. Um, we, we are doing a lot of, um, I, we're doing a lot of interviews and things like that now. Um, everybody right now is very interested in talking to airport directors about what's going on with travel. So we are getting the messaging out that way through our chambers. Um, you know, through participating in dis different events like this one. So um, that's that's the type of outreach that we're doing right now. Okay, great. Mark? I would only add that not everybody hears the same uh, or in the same fashion. And sometimes they all don't hear the same message. So diversity is key. Uh, I, even on this call, I know that we have leaders from, uh, from Broward County, whether we're funneling messages back through our chambers of commerce, um, you know, our economic development arms through county government, every, you know, imaginable channel that is available in social media, but, but know your audience. We, we talk to a lot of different folks. We publish newsletters that folks maybe like to get their, their, uh, their information via a newsletter, but we also have a phenomenal public information team who has a robust almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, social media presence on Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, Twitter. And we answer in real time um, as best we can. And I think that that gets its way around um, the social media circuit, that people are there, they're listening, they care. Uh, and, and hopefully with all those efforts, we're getting the message across that we're all really working hard to make sure that you're safe when you come through our airports. Great, great. Um, can each one of you give us a brief, um, we have about 20 minutes left and we've gotten through, only, we've gotten through about four of a, like, six, seven, eight questions. But, uh, but one of the things I think is important is um, where are the airlines going and where are the airports going in the future? Um, Laura, why don't you start us off? Do you mind you telling us, you know, where you see, you know, post, certainly post COVID, where are the airports going over the next decade? Um, we actually just completed a new master plan for our airport that does include um, expansion of uh, one of our concourses. Um, we currently have a lot of pre-security space. The plan is to make much of that post-security. Um, that's where all the action is. That's where the concessions are. That's where the people want to be. Um, so we, we have a 30-year-old terminal. Um, so we, we do struggle with space sometimes. So we do want to make sure that we're continuing with some of those projects to add additional space. Um, the plan is to relocate our security checkpoints, um, and eventually, uh, if our tr if our traffic gets back up to the levels that they were pre-COVID, um, we are looking to a potential runway expansion as well. 
Um, so we do have a lot of really good plans for the airport. However, our focus today really is on maintenance of our critical functions, maintaining our facilities. Um, we are continuing with a um, concourse expansion project. It is fully funded um, already. So we thought, well, it makes sense to continue to do it. It's good for the economy, it's good for the airport, and it's, it, it will be good for social distancing as well. Okay, Mark. Um, so two, two schools of thought or strategy. So pre-COVID, um, our airport was one of the fastest, actually we were the fastest growing large hub airport in the United States in 2017, 2018. We bumped all the way up to 37 million passengers uh, last year in 2019, um, completing a $3.2 billion um, uh, expansion program. And the FAA is putting the final touches on the review on what was a, a three-phase uh, multi-billion dollar program with phase one uh, coming in at about $3.6 billion with great enthusiasm from our airlines and from all our business partners and whatnot, and COVID hits. So the schools of thought are, what do we do now? Do we keep rolling, um, um, imagining that there is light on the other side of, of this tunnel and, and let's take advantage of, of low construction costs and be ready for when the traveler is ready to go again? Or as we're seeing right now, um, airlines are in deep trouble. Uh, they're going through cash uh, and millions and millions of dollars a day. Uh, not really sure where they're gonna be at the end of the year. They're not even sure where they're gonna be on October 1 when the CARES Act runs out and you could see massive, massive layoffs on the airline side of the house, slimming things down. Rating agencies are looking at the aviation sector as a whole. We've already seen a number of airports downgraded. Uh, really, really good airports, well-run airports, great credit ratings um, with strong balance sheets and whatnot that are getting downgraded. We all have to be very, very careful. Uh, these are not easy questions about, you know, do you take that step forward and, and what if it's wrong? Um, we already have approval to build our next terminal. Uh, the airlines have already voted on it and we're ready to go to bond market and, and sell. Do we need the capacity? We think we will. It'll take us three to four years to build that terminal facility and hopefully we'll be on the right side. And we do have great enthusiasm from them to move forward. Three and a half billion dollars, that's a little bit bigger question, but, but we're still getting great enthusiasm from our partners, knowing that these things in airport world, sometimes they take 10, 15, 20 years just to come to fruition. If we sit back now, it'll may, it may never actually come into reality. Okay, makes sense. Um, Lester, what are your thoughts? So we, last year, last summer actually, we, we put together and got approval for a, a new CIP to the tune of $5 billion, uh, approved by the airlines, approved by our local elected officials. And just now uh, we're dealing with the situation where we were planning on building all this infrastructure. Um, so what does that do to us, right? So we took a pause and figured out which projects needed to continue, right? Those projects that were gonna be able to take advantage of the downturn, if you will, on traffic, uh, whether it be passenger, airlines or cargo airlines and be able to speed those projects up, take advantage of the loan, if you will. But we still have on the books the, the $5 billion CIP. So because we're not at, we don't believe, and I have to be careful how I say this, because sometimes when, you, when I say this publicly, people think, oh my God, you can't be adverse to risk, right? And, and I'll give you the perfect example. When we built the North Terminal, um, and I was, I was involved in that, in that program originally, to the tune of $1.2 billion, they, they thought that in today's dollars that we would be in the $30 per plane passenger. Back then, when you would show that number to people, you were, people were thinking, oh, you must be completely crazy to spend $1.2 billion on, on, on a terminal. In fact, our cost for employment is now in the $18 to $19. So we overperformed. We overperformed because you brought more people to the airport. So you have to take advantage a calculated risk, right? To see what is the right type of capital project that you're going to put out, recognizing that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a gamble, but you have to be, be willing to take that risk, banking on that there will be a return of the traffic. If the situation doesn't improve, then you have to delay programs or projects. And you have to be willing to do that on a constantly, on a daily basis, but and I'll get back to the communication. In, in the past, in this, in this airport, we used to do a lot of things without uh, airline approval, if you will. 
In fact, the new agreement that we have requires the airlines to be involved. So I'm constantly making the case for programs or projects to the airlines, and I won't take an item, even though I can, without the airline's approval to the Board of County Commissions, because I need to make sure that my stakeholders are in agreement with what our rationale and our decision-making for how this airport's gonna look five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. But I will tell you right now, it's spending a dollar for an airport, the airlines are just so, they're, they're, they're positioned it's so risky that they're very, very much involved in what is the cost and how are we spending a single capital dollar that may turn into an expense that they're gonna to have to pay over the next five, 10 years if, if they're still around. Gary, if I can just add one point on yeah. that. Yeah. I think it, Lester hit a great, a great point. You know, I have the same issue here. If you take something to the Board of County Commissioners for approval, but it doesn't have the blessing of the airlines, those who actually ultimately pay for these projects, they back the debt service. Um, not, a, not a lot of folks know that in, in, in our, our case, where it's known as a residual based airport, you know, the airlines sign on to back our debt long term and they get certain rights that are granted to them. And one of the rights that are granted to them for signatory carriers is the ability to vote up or down on major capital projects. So to, to Lester's point, we may want to say go, 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 go. And our commission may want to say go, go, go. And then we take it to our airlines, those who are going to back the debt. And they say, we're not ready for this. We don't want yeah. cash is king. We're trying to preserve our cash right now. So it's, it's a little bit touch and go. You really have to have great relationships with your business partners on the airline side and a very, very supportive board um, or, or entity that you report to that's willing to back you because some of these decisions are a bit risky. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm reading some comments and questions on the, uh, the chat area. And, and just so you guys know, um, we started with close to 150 people on this and it's growing. So people aren't leaving. So you guys are very interesting. And again, a midway, almost towards the end, a thank you to everybody for com coming on board. Uh, Pierre comments that I was at Fort Lauderdale this morning visiting with Delta as they were are showcasing how they are sanitizing their service, space touch points and the aircraft. It was impressive to see really safe environment for travelers. Um, is Florida, are we seeing I would imagine we are, but I don't, but you guys would know. Are, are we seeing less travelers, say, say uh, a larger percentage less than other airports around the country where COVID isn't flaring up as much? It's, it's across the entire country. Us compared, to, us compared to the rest of the nation? Yeah. I think it's an airport by airport. I think Laura's situation may be different than my situation. I, I just went through, uh, we had a, a well-known uh, airport consultant, uh, MIT professor, who's been working on aviation issues for a number of years, gave a presentation to one of our airport associations, and he ranked uh, those airports that were having the best recovery and those that were not doing so well in recovery. And they broke them down in terms of large hub, medium hub, small hub, uh, you know, not to toot our horn here, but FLL came out the number one airport in terms of recovery in the large hub category. Lester's Airport Miami was right behind us in there. I, I, so I do think that um, travel through certain sectors is, is there. We've seen this downturn, um, unfortunately, just within the last couple of weeks. Uh, things were really looking up in May into June and into July, but we're, we're now seeing the downturn because of the research back in the COVID. We're gonna go back downhill again a little bit in August. We're hoping that what we experienced in June and July, that resilience factor, the ability to bounce back, will be there again um, when we hopefully get this vaccine uh, and, and or good therapeutics and, and go back in. But I, I think that the state of Florida, to be honest with you, has, has great resiliency and may back bounce back faster than many other portions of the country, to be honest. I agree, I agree. Um, there's a question here that um, you guys may understand better than I do, but this comes from uh, somebody who submitted a question earlier. Um, have you considered utilization of uh, mechanical and electrical technologies utilized in other industries such as gaming, entertainment, healthcare, and hospitality to improve cleanliness of your facilities and health combat uh, COVID at the airports. Anybody, anybody want to speak? I, 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 will, I will say that we're we're doing we're taking measures 
that have been proven to be effective and can be deployed through a large, large real estate that we have. But our focus is not just on that. Our focus is on enforcement and, and compliance with the face masks, social distancing, because let's face it, you can go and disinfect a, a, a high touch point, an elevator, right? But if somebody then goes and touches it, 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 it so you may have, or whatever measures you took, may have now been, now you've contaminated that elevator, let's just say somebody, somebody is back sick. So while well, yes, we're taking measures to keep the place as clean as possible, our, our, our primary focus is on the individual responsibility. So now there's a lot of people selling new technologies, um, but it's, it's, we don't want to be the guinea pig for anything. We want to make sure that's something that's tried and true. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, I, I would. Um, we actually are looking at changes to our conditions for better filtration. Um, we already do have UV um, light in certain of our um, our air conditioning system locations. We're looking to expand some of that. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different ways that we can um, provide uh, a better environment at the airport. Um, so you know, nothing really is off the table, but we, like, like Lester, we are really looking for those things that will have a, a, a effect for the entire building. Um, the elect like the electrostatic fogging. Um, uh, we're also looking at ways that we can modify our security checkpoints as traffic starts to increase again. Um, so we nothing really is off the table, um, but it does need to make sense. And I think um, Lester also made a really good point about um, personal responsibility, which is what we're trying to stress through our public messaging. Gotcha. Okay. Mark, you want to add, Gary, is that uh, in the times of, of crisis, uh, particularly health and life safety crisis, what seems crazy today uh, may actually be um, one of the greatest innovations uh, tomorrow going forward. And, and I think that this has challenged a lot of us to think about how we deliver the services that we provide and do it in such a way that's cost effective. You know, uh, five years ago, or not five years ago, many years ago, somebody might have thought it was crazy to sprinkler an entire building, you know, to prevent it against fire, what it costs to put that system in. I've, I've challenged my team in a kind of a crazy thought and said, okay, if we're going running around and we're doing electrostatic spraying and we're doing fogging in small areas, could we come up with a terminal wide way to fog an entire terminal overnight uh, using almost a sprinkler type system? What would that look like? Right. What would it cost? If you do the return on investment and the, uh, the evaluative cost comparison, pay back over a number of years, what would it look like? It may not pan out, but if we don't actually think about these things today, they'll never happen in tomorrow's design terminal. Agreed. Last question, and I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to do a quick comment, and then I'm going to pass it off to the experts. But generally, the question was, uh, do you think uh, because of COVID-19, it's going to change the airline industries and more people will in the future elect not to travel on business and do more, more of these Zoom conferences. And um, I, I'll give you my perspective is that uh, there's, the, the, I, don't, I, I don't think so. Um, I've also was at, you know, a lot of the conferences that I go to have been canceled. Just in the middle of the last couple of days at a conference which we paid to, to attend from another one of my businesses. And it was a conference that was online and it was so difficult to navigate which room you wanted to be in. And it was, you know, I don't think anything, you know, I think people want to be with people. It's a basic, uh, it's in our DNA, but I'm going to let the experts answer that question. Um, plus, sir, you want to go first? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard to tell. I, I think the the airline industry is is relatively young, uh, and but it's had to be very resilient and constantly adapt. And uh, I, I believe that 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 they'll, they'll do that. But the the big unknown is what happens with is there a vaccine or is there not a vaccine or is it just something that we're going to have to continue to to deal with? But it's they'll adapt. It, it, whoever remains, whoever survives. Whoever is able to endure will have to adapt to, to, to the new demands. Laura? 
I, I'm cautiously optimistic that air travel will start to recover. We actually, um, like Mark, started to see a really good rebound um, starting the beginning of July as, you know, the cases started to climb in the South Florida area um, and the quarantine orders went into effect in the Northeast. Um, our, our capacity started to get pulled back again. So we're, we're pretty flat now between June and July. Um, but you can see as July was coming in, our capacity was increasing and as passengers were, were starting to feel more comfortable, we were seeing a really, a pretty good rebound. So, you know, it's hard to tell when that actual sustained rebound will happen, but I believe it will because I think there's that pinup energy and desire to, to travel again. Um, I, I think a lot of people are getting pretty stir crazy from being at home as long as they have been. Um, and, and they do want to take that trip. So, I think that um, it may not be this year, um, but I do think that we will at some point um, in hopefully the relatively near future start to see some um, some recovery occurring. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, Clayton, um, I'm having a hard time seeing if uh, if the some of the Q and A questions or is there anything I missed in Q and A? We want to do a, maybe one last final question. Yeah, we, we've got a few. We could do a quick rapid fire. We still got five minutes or so. Um, sure. I've got one, and we can just whoever wants to jump in. We've got about a handful of questions or so. Do you think short uh, haul flights will ever come back, or are they gone for good? Short or long? Short. I, I think short haul. Short haul falls like uh, I, I think you're going to see people are willing more so now to jump on a plane for a, for an hour or two than they are for nine hours to go uh, to Europe. Got it. Okay. Uh, estimate your respective passenger counts as a percentage of last year, uh, year over year. 40%. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Based on fiscal year, we're probably going to be in the same ballpark, uh, maybe a little bit better. We had a very hot um, beginning of our fiscal year. Um, calendar year, it's a little, looking at it a little bit differently. Same here. Fiscal year is not too bad, uh, but calendar year, given this uh, <laughs> February time frame, yeah. All right. Uh, George Chanberry from uh, NSU says, I saw in the news that JetBlue is doing robotic infrared cleaning that would clean an airplane in 10 minutes. Yeah. Did you see that for all airlines in the future? Yeah, the uh, it's a UV uh, test uh, with uh, robotics uh, going down uh, the aisle to clean the airplane. And I think they still need to do some, some touch point cleaning. I don't know that it get necessarily gets into you know, pull down trays and, and whatnot. But if the UV technology, which we're starting to look at even it, and I know uh, my colleagues are as well, that, you know, if you think about um, escalator handrails uh, that you might be able to clean with UV technology constantly as the handrails circulate, um, if you can do it like we talked about earlier um, in an innovative fashion at a cost effective way and, and to be highly effective, you know, it's killing the germs. I can certainly see that happening in airlines across the U.S. and across the world, actually. Okay. Well, Clayton, we have uh, we have one minute left, so I'm going to uh, just, um, once again, I know the three of you are incredibly busy. I appreciate you taking the time. There was great interest in this, and um, thank you one more time. I want to thank uh, the sponsors. Clayton, I'll leave it to you to wrap things up. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head just again. Uh, Mark, Lester, Laura, thank you again so, so much for your time. This was just very informative, very, very good conversation on the top of a lot of our minds. To all of our, our regular CEO Connect sponsors, uh, Bill, Gianna, Mike, and Mike, thank you so much again in Celebrity Cruises as well. We couldn't make it. And for all of you that attended today, the 150 plus, thank you again. We appreciate it. We will be featuring this in an upcoming issue of South Florida Business and Wealth, also on our website, in our e-newsletter, and on our social media channels. So if, for whatever reason, if someone wants to see this that didn't have a chance to see it live today, there will be many more opportunities. That being said, everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay safe.